Aloha, welcome to part three of lecture number 12, the last part of lecture number 12. I know it's been a long and arduous journey, hasn't it? Uh, so let's see, so far we have covered the formation of, um, we've covered intramembranous intra bone formation, endochondral bone formation, the formation of cartilage and the long bones, the formation of joints. We've uh, talked about the formation of the axial skeleton, including the spine, ribs, sternum, and the skull. And that leaves us with muscles. So here we go. On to muscles. An interesting thing about muscles, there are actually three different types. We have skeletal muscle, which is also called striated muscle. We have cardiac muscle and we have smooth muscle. All of it, regardless of the type, is derived from mesenchyme, except for one place in your body, which is the iris of your eye. The iris is made of smooth muscle that is derived from neuroectoderm. So first we're gonna talk about skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle, it's good stuff. Helps us move around and do all kinds of other good stuff. Uh, so let's talk about segmented muscle first, uh, like the intercostal muscles, the muscles of the back, the abdominal muscles, as opposed to the muscles of the appendages, okay? Um, it's pretty simple. Basically you have uh, the, somites and the myotomes from the somites uh, in the con uh, corresponding area of the body are going to start to differentiate into myoblasts. So these myoblast cells then start to elongate into a spindle shape and guess what they do? They join together. Sounds familiar, huh? There's a lot of, a lot of places in the body that that sort of thing happens. Um, but anyway, uh, they start to form this long skinny shape and they start to merge together with other myocytes. This forms these long uh, multinucleated cells, okay? And this would be an immature muscle fiber. Then what happens is these um, long multinucleated cells start to lay down contractile fibers and the contractile fibers appear in the form of myofibrils and myofilaments. You guys can go over those in your physiology class. There's a lot to learn about those. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, then these immature muscle cells start to join up with still other immature muscle cells, and you end up with these multinucleated muscle fibers that can be very, very long. Um, now, as these cells, as, as you grow, as a person grows, uh, these muscle fibers, of course, need to become longer as well. They need to grow with the person. So the way that a muscle fiber becomes longer or a muscle cell becomes longer is by adding new segments of myofibrils and filaments while extending the cell membrane, right? So they have all these um, striated segments that are full of myofibrils and myofilaments, and they simply add more of these sections. They extend the cell membrane a little farther and they add more of these little sections. Now, um, when the muscle increases in diameter, it, it doesn't do it by um, adding more segments. Rather than adding more segments, it just adds additional fibrils and filaments to the existing segment. So like this little teeny segment right here, this little teeny skinny segment, as the muscle wants to increase in diameter, will just, this segment will get bigger, right? We'll add more myofibrils and myofilaments to this to make it, you know, fatter. Uh, that might be on the quiz too, so let me repeat it so you have a chance to write it down. Uh, the muscles increase in diameter by adding more fibrils and filaments to existing segments, not by adding additional segments. They increase in length by adding additional segments, but they increase in diameter by adding more fibers, to, uh, fibrils and filaments to existing segments. Okay, now... While these guys are busy maturing, there are also fibroblast cells in the area. And those fibroblast cells are also derived from myotome tissue. 
right? So the same myotome tissue within the somite uh, forms these fibroblast cells. These guys are making highly organized fibrous connective tissue. And this connective tissue binds the muscle tubes together into little bundles. And these little bundles of, of muscle fibers, uh, so this membrane around these little muscle uh, bundles of muscle fibers is called the perimyceum. It also makes a membrane that surrounds the entire outside of the whole muscle, which is called the epimyceum, right? So we have the epimyceum and the perimyceum that surround a whole muscle and little bundles within the muscle uh, that are formed by um, fibroblast cells that were derived from myotome tissue. Now, there is also a layer of fibers that separates each individual muscle fiber, each individual muscle tube. This is called the endomyceum. This endomyceum membrane is produced by the muscle cell itself, not by the fibroblasts. Uh, now the muscles in the extremity are formed in exactly the same way. There's just one difference. The only difference is that uh, the myotome tissue from the somites migrates. It migrates into the limb buds from the you know, somites that are nearby. Uh, it migrates into the limb buds. And once it gets into the limb buds, exactly the same process occurs as in the segmented muscles. Uh, and then the muscle simply elongates as the limb grows. So as your arms and your legs grow, all those muscles, um, all, the, all the myoblasts that are gonna become those muscles, they're already there and they just form this process, they just go through this process and elongate as the, as the limb grows. They get longer with the limb. Uh, cool. So also important to note is that as these, um, as the somites develop, um, the myotome region splits actually into two segments. There is a dorsal segment and a ventral segment. So this dorsal segment is called the epaxial segment and the ventral segment is called the hypaxial segment. Now, the reason that this matters is because when the motor nerves are sent out, they also split into a primary dorsal and a primary ventral ramus. So they split into two branches, one that is the primary dorsal and the primary ventral. Now the ventral ramus innervates all of the hypaxial division muscles. And this is gonna be on the quiz. I know it's tough, <laughs> like hardcore members, but just uh, go ahead and jot it down. The ventral ramus innervates the hypaxial division muscles and the dorsal ramus innervates the epaxial muscles. This matters a lot if you're a chiropractor because you deal a lot with people that have dysfunctional muscles, muscles that aren't working. And it's really, really helpful to know, did that come from the front of the nerve or from the back of the nerve? Which nerve root is it? And which division of that nerve root is innervating that muscle? Uh, we actually have to memorize, uh, I don't know, I, I probably mentioned it before, but chiropractors actually get about four times as much neurology in their education as an average medical doctor does. The only kinds of doctors that get more neurology education than we do are the neurologists. So uh, this is important stuff for us to know, you know, for obvious reasons, because we're dealing with the musculoskeletal system. Uh, now, anyway, so one more time, ventral ramus innervates the hypaxial division muscles and the dorsal ramus innervates the epaxial muscles. Now, the easy way, the easiest way that I could come up with in school to remember this <clears throat> was looking at a fish or a dolphin, right? So a fish or a dolphin, the ventral surface is on the bottom, right? And hypaxial sounds like hypo, which means below. So I just always remembered that the hypaxial muscles that sounds like hypo were uh, on a fish towards the ventral surface, which is also on the bottom of the fish, the below surface of the fish. That's not a really great memory trick, but it worked for me. So maybe it'll work for you. Um, and then, you know, the dorsal ramus innervates the epaxial muscles. I just remembered that that was the other one. If I could remember that ventral was hypaxial, then dorsal had to be epaxial and I was good to go, okay? So uh, let's talk about which muscles are which for a second. So the epaxial muscles for the most part are the muscles on the trunk, 
and the neck that bend you backwards. So the muscles on your trunk and your neck that bend you backwards are the epaxial muscles. Um, interestingly, there used to be extensor muscles on the sacrococcygeal region, right, right down there where your tailbone is, uh, just like animals with tails. Right? We used to have muscles down there, but as we continued to develop and grow, those muscles, those tail muscles that we had eventually degenerated and it became the sacral and, and uh, coccygeal ligaments. They just kind of dig, uh, degenerated into ligament tissue because we don't have a use for them. We don't have a tail. Now, um, the hypaxial division muscles form the trunk and neck muscles that bend you sideways or forwards. They also form the limb muscles, the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm, and the pelvic floor muscles, as well as the quadratus lumborum. So the quadratus lumborum is kind of an exception because when they engage together, they actually bend you backwards, but when they engage individually, they bend you side to side. So they're kind of an exception. But yes, hypaxial muscles, uh, all the muscles in your trunk and neck that bend you forward. So your abdominal muscles, your... Uh, <clears throat> SCM muscles, um, all of that kind of stuff that bends you forward or sideways. But also including the limbs, the intercostals, the diaphragm, the pelvic floor. Um, there's a few more of those than there are uh, the epaxial muscles. Uh, the pharyngeal arch muscle are the the muscles of the face form a little differently. So they form from pharyngeal arch tissue uh, the pharyngeal arches develop myoblasts separate from the somites, right? So these pharyngeal arch myoblasts form the muscles of mastication, the muscles of facial expression, and the muscles of the pharynx and larynx, okay? Now, <clears throat> these muscles are all innervated by cranial nerves, right? So that's an easy way for me to remember is that any muscle that was in, that's innervated by a cranial nerve with a couple exceptions, most of the muscles that are innervated with cranial nerves, right? Um, were not derived from somites. They were derived from pharyngeal arch myoblasts, okay? Um, the ocular muscles, um, <clears throat> similarly developed from myotomes separate from the somites. Um, these are called the preotic myotomes, right? The preotic myotomes, which means in front of the ear. Uh, preotic myotomes are derived from mesenchyme of the precordial plate, <clears throat> right? So this is my, um, mesenchyme that's the neighbor of the, of the cardiogenic area. Uh, mesenchyme in front of the precordial plate. Uh, and just for the sake of being thorough, uh, the muscles of the tongue are derived from somites, the occipital somites. So the muscles of the tongue are derived from myotomes of the occipital somites. Uh, and that's going to about uh, pretty much do it for skeletal muscle. So let's move on to smooth muscle. Remember clear back in the day when we talked about this stuff right here? Um, yeah, this is... Uh, Splanchnic mesoderm, splanchnic mesoderm. So smooth muscle does not come from somites. It does not, it mostly comes from this stuff. Um, you remember back in the day when we talked about the vascular system being mostly derived from mesenchyme? At least that was on a quiz. I think actually most of you got that question wrong, which probably means I didn't cover it very well in the notes, but all of the vascular system is mostly derived from mesenchyme tissue, right? So the smooth muscle that lines the blood vessels is derived from the same mesenchyme that gave rise to the blood vessels themselves, okay? Uh, similarly, the smooth muscle in the gut is derived from the mesenchyme of the gut and so on. The notable exception to this is the smooth muscle in the iris of the eye. That stuff is derived from neuroectoderm which remarkably in the iris of your eye, the neuroectoderm differentiates into somehow myoblasts. <laughs> it transforms into myoblasts and then develops into smooth muscle from uh, neuroectoderm. It's really incredible. Uh, some of the things that your body is able to do, some of the things that your DNA is able to do. Uh, but let me repeat this because this is gonna be on the quiz, okay? 
mesenchyme that gives rise to blood. Oh, sorry. Um, the smooth muscle that lines the blood vessels is derived from the same mesenchyme that gave rise to the vessels themselves. So the same mesenchyme that gives rise to the blood vessels also gives rise to the smooth muscle of those vessels. The same thing happens in the gut. The smooth muscle in the gut is derived from the mesenchyme associated with the structures of the gut. But the iris of the eye is formed from neuroectoderm. <laughs> Okay, so make sure that you got that down. Make sure that you remember that because that little bit of information is definitely going to be on the quiz. And I also think it's on the final. Um, so the way the smooth muscle forms uh, at first is very similar to skeletal muscle. Uh, the mesenchyme differenti differentiates into myocytes. These myocytes, right, we have the myoblasts and these guys begin to elongate and cluster together. The difference is they don't merge together. They do not merge membranes. They remain separate. They remain mononucleated. Each cell produces its own contractile fibers within itself, but they do not merge. So one of the primary effects of this arrangement is that the contraction is much slower. Now that doesn't make it any weaker, not to any degree. Remember the myometrium of the uterus, that is all smooth muscle. And any woman who has ever had a child can tell you that there is nothing weak about the contraction of that uterus. It is one of the strongest muscle contractions you will ever experience in your life, unless you're a man. <laughs> um, so the thing is that this type of muscle, smooth muscle, generally isn't being uh, stimulated by electricity the way skeletal muscles are. It's usually stimulated by chemical signals, uh, things like, um, acetylcholine and norepinephrine and, and, and all these different kinds of, of transmitter chemicals are, are going to be what cause these muscles to contract, right? So you have these autonomic neurons, they come down and they have this bulb at the end and this bulb releases a cloud of these uh, neurochemicals and those neurochemicals then stimulate these muscle cells to contract. And yes, it can be an extremely strong contraction depending on the amount of chemicals released the number of receptors that get um, that the chemical gets into. Um, so I guess that's about it for smooth muscle. Oh uh, yeah, so next, next we're gonna move on to cardiac muscle. Last but certainly not least, cardiac muscle is very, very important, okay? So who remembers where the mesenchyme comes from that, develop, that uh, forms the cardiac muscles? You guys remember this guy from way back on the third week of development? Way back in the third week of development, there were these cells from the primitive node and the primitive streak that were migrating upwards and around into the cardiogenic area and then immediately started differentiating into cardiac muscle, right? So the excuse me, the cardiac muscle cells, the myoblasts that form the cardiac muscle originated in the primitive node and the primitive streak way back in the third week of development. So let me say that one more time so you can write it down because this one might turn up on a quiz too. Pretty much guarantee you it will. Cardiac muscle begins to develop in the third week of development from mesoderm cells originating in the primitive node and the primitive streak. They migrate around in front of the precordial plate into the cardiogenic area and immediately begin to differentiate into cardiac, cardiogenic myoblasts. Okay, so as these guys develop, they elongate and they incorporate fibrils and filaments and they even have a striated appearance like skeletal muscle does, but they do not merge together. They remain separate cells and they remain each with a single nucleus. But the way that they arrange themselves is interesting. Um, they glue themselves together end to end uh, using this thing called a gap junction. And these gap junctions create intercalated discs, right? You can see right here, intercalated discs, right? So these intercalated discs form these gap junctions. Um, what this allows is it allows electrical signals to be transmitted from cell to cell 
very, very quickly, lightning fast. And that's important because you don't want slow muscle contractions in your heart. That would be a bad thing, right? So these intercalated discs and gap junctions allow for rapid transfer of electrical signals um, from cell to cell. Uh, anybody remember when the heart starts beating? For those of you that didn't, it's day 21, okay? At day 21, when it starts beating, the heart is very, very small. But of course, it's not going to stay very, very small. It's going to actually get quite a lot bigger, about as big as your fist, right? So up to a certain point, it gets bigger by adding new cells. New cells get added, more and more and more cells get added. But after it reaches a certain point, it stops adding new cells. It has as many as it needs, but the heart's still going to get bigger, right? You're not finished growing at that point. So after that, it starts to increase size the same way that skeletal muscle does, right? These Myo, uh, these sections of myofibrils and myofilaments, uh, it, it simply adds more segments of them, right? So within the cell, the cell membrane like this, uh, cell membrane is gonna extend a little further out and they're gonna add more and more segments of these myofibrils and myofilaments. And then uh, same way, when it increases in diameter, it's simply gonna add more of the myofibrils and myofilaments to the existing um, segments, okay? Same way that skeletal muscle gets bigger. Uh, let's see. Now at this point, um, the book starts to go over uh, the development of the limbs and the innervation of the limbs and all this other kind of stuff. But I actually found all that to be super redundant. We've pretty much covered it already. Uh, the one thing that I will cover is the blood supply that goes out to the limbs, but we're going to actually talk about that in chapter 14 next week. So that is going to do it for the section on the musculoskeletal system. Congratulations, we made it through. Hooray for us. Uh, I know that was beefy and it was meaty and it was a ton of information. I mean, it took us, you know, three recordings, you know, three parts of that lecture to get through it. And yes, this quiz is going to be a monster. It's a, I believe it's the longest quiz and I think it's one of the hardest quizzes. So it really would behoove you if you can arrange it to try and show up for the um, quiz review on Thursday. Um, if you're not able to make it, then, you know, talk to your classmates, communicate with them, uh, tell them why you can't make it, throw yourself on their mercy, says, please, please, please take good notes for me and give them to me so that I can do awesome on the quiz too. Um, but as much as you can, please try to make it to this, um, to this review. Um, and then also, like I always say, every lecture, if you have any questions, if you need something clarified, if there's something you would like to know more about, please write those questions down so that you don't forget what they are and bring those questions with you to the Zoom meeting and see if I know the answer. If you stump me, there's an opportunity for everybody to get extra credit, okay? Um, also, now that we're in the second half of the semester, while we're talking about extra credit, um, you know what, no, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later on. We'll, we'll cover another chapter or two and then we'll get into some of the opportunities for extra credit. In the meantime, please come show up to the Zoom meeting, bring your questions with you. Any question that stumps me is an opportunity for everybody to get extra credit because I will then ask you guys to go research the answers for me. And if you, uh, you don't even have to necessarily find the right answer, but if I can see that you made effort and tried to find the right answer and uh, even got me like a plausible answer, <laughs> Um, then yeah, I'll give you extra credit for that. And depending on how much effort you show, you might get more or less. But anyway, uh, have a great weekend. Uh, study hard. Hopefully I'll see you at the Zoom meeting and good luck on the quiz. Aloha.